Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe believe. this is the word of God. God. I believe what God says because it is impossible impossible. for God to lie. Today I want to tackle a subject that's it's going to seem kind of theological, uh, but it's a subject that needs to be dealt with because in the church many, many, many denominations hold to this truth that they feel is a truth, but it's not really true. And because they hold to it, many people are led astray. Many people are taken away from faith because of this belief in something that sounds so right, but it is so wrong. And it's, it's a doctrine. Uh, the word doctrine just comes from the Greek word didaskalos, which means doctrine. It means technically... That's a transliterated word. It means teaching. So this doctrine, this teaching, has caused many people to miss the prosperity, to miss the healing, to miss the joy in life that they should have because they're believing something that sounds so good and so right, but it is so wrong. And that is this. It's the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. And when you ask people, is God sovereign? 98% of the church is going to say, yes, of course he's sovereign. Well, what does sovereignty mean? Now, this is going to sound really, really right. But I'm going to show you the flaw in it here in a few moments. God is sovereign means that he is in control. He is in control of all things, large and small. And he rules over all things. It means he has power and authority over nature, earthly kings, all history, angels, and demons. The sovereignty of God is so strong that even Satan himself must ask God's permission before he does something. God is not bound or limited by the dictates of his created beings. And God is the final cause of every every single thing that has ever happened, and that is happening, and that will happen. It all happens because he either initiates it or he allows it. In other words... The sovereignty of God, and many denominations believe this strongly, the sovereignty of God means simply this. Everything that's happened, either God did it or God allowed it. And I'm telling you, that is not what the Bible teaches. And if you believe that and you act on that principle, it will not allow faith to work in your life And the sovereignty of God teaching makes much of the Bible ineffective and actually useless to us. Now, where do they get this idea? Well, they they take it from the reality that God did create everything. The Bible tells us everything that was made that was made was made through the Word. And it tells us in John, the first chapter, in verse 14, that the Word became flesh. Jesus is the Word. Everything was created by Him and through Him and for Him. He created everything. And they take this scripture, for example, Matthew 19, 26. It says, But Jesus looked at them and said to them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Well, did Jesus tell the truth? Yes, he did. With God, all things are possible. But you can't extrapolate that out to mean that God causes everything that happens to happen. See, this is where some denominations and some groups believe in predestination. They believe that 
There are people who are predestined to be saved, and there are people who are predestined to be lost, and that nothing you can do can change that. You become a part of the elect, and it's predestined. You know, many are called, but few are chosen. Well, how does Bible predestination work anyway? When, when the writings of Paul say that we were predestined for something, well, that means the way we think of it is it's predetermined and it can't be changed. If you're predestined to be this, you're going to be that. But the true definition of that word and the, and the true essence of the scripture is that many are called but few are chosen. The way that is meant to be understood is many are called and the ones who answer the call come forward and they are the ones who are chosen. So it gets down to choice. And if you have a choice, then God is not sovereign. If you have a choice, God is not sovereign because you are in control of your choice. God does not make you choose to do evil. He doesn't make you he doesn't make you choose to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He calls you, he invites you, he beckons you, but you have to either accept or reject. It's not God's choice, it's your choice. One third of the angels in heaven fell for the lie of Lucifer that somehow he could be like God. They made a choice. Lucifer made a choice. And because of their choice, they were cast down. Does God choose that some should be lost? Hmm. Wow. Well, we need to understand this. It is true that God was not created. And it is true that we were created by Him through His Son, the Word. God created for us, in the expanse of eternity, He created for us a place called time. Time did not always exist. Time was created. Even scientists may say, well, no, time, time itself has always existed. No, no, time has not always existed. In fact, the scripture tells us that in Titus 1-2. In the same scripture that tells us that it's impossible for God to lie, it says, in hope of eternal life, which God, who can, cannot lie, Promised, when did he promise this? Before time began. Before time began. So there was a beginning to time. So God is all powerful. Everything that you see was created from things you don't see. That's scripture. Who created it? God is the creator. See, but. If God was sovereign, then he would, he would get what he wants. Wouldn't you say so? If, if God makes all the decisions and he wants something, then he's going to get what he wants, right? Well, let's take a look at what the scripture says. In 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering, in other words, patient, toward us. Now listen to this. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's not his will. He's not willing. It's not his will that anybody should perish. 
It's not his will. What, he, what does he want? He wants everyone to come to repentance. Now just let me ask you this. Is God going to get what he wants? No. What's he want? He wants everyone to come to repentance. Is everyone going to come to repentance? No. Why? Because God has delegated that portion of his sovereignty to you. You have freedom of choice. Everything that God has created that he wants to worship him, he has created with the choice of whether you're going to worship him or not. The angels had a choice. A third of them chose poorly. Didn't work out too well for them. The watchers had a choice. They chose poorly. It didn't work out too well for them. To this day, they're in Tartarus. What's your choice going to be? Are you going to give God what he wants? Or not? Hmm. Now, Here's, here's the thing you need to understand. There are unconditional promises and unconditional statements from him, and there are conditional statements. Unconditional means it doesn't matter what you do or what you think. If God has said it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Now, let me give you an example. And, and there's literally hundreds and hundreds of examples but I don't really have time, according to Ryan and Jim, to give you all those examples. But I'm going to give you one here. Jesus is returning for the church. And nothing you do can stop it. No choice. No choice you make. You, you, now listen. You can't speed it up. You can't slow it down. It's in God's timing. The Father knows. And when, when the Father says, Son, I'm sending you, you know, give the trumpet a toot and let the people come up and the dead in Christ will rise. It's when, when God said it's going to happen at a certain time, let me tell you something, it's going to happen at a certain time. Now here's, here's what it says. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 for the Lord himself will descend. See, that, that's God saying this is going to happen. He will. This is not your choice. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Well, I've heard people debate, what can we do to maybe change that? Nothing. Who's going to rise first? The dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. I don't care if you're a born-again believer, you can strap yourself into a pair of snow skis and bury them in ice and you're not going to stay here when the trumpet toots, you're going to shoot. It's going to happen. It's, it's established. The dead in Christ will rise. Then we who are alive and in Christ will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. See, that's, that's unconditional. That's a promise from God. You can't change it. It's established. Your choice. You can choose to go or not to go, but you do that by choosing Jesus as your Lord and Savior or not. But if you're a born-again believer, you're going to go. And if you're not a born-again believer, you're not going to go. It's established. But now there are conditional promises. And this is where people get off. I heard a minister say the other day, that there are some people God has just established to be rich and some he's established to be poor. There are some people he's established to be healthy and live a long life and there's others that he is, he's said, no, they're, they're going to die early or they're going to live with this sickness or disease because God is ruler of everything and he makes all the choices for mankind. 
Well, let me give you an example here. Salvation. God is not the total authority over your salvation. He has made a way for you to be saved. But whether you are born again and saved or not is your choice. Listen to this, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, see, you see the qualifier here? Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He didn't say he sent his son so that everyone would have everlasting life. No, there's a qualifier. Whoever believes in him should not perish. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Once again, God's will is that everybody gets saved. That's what he wants. But only whoever believes in the Son is saved. See, he didn't come, he didn't come to condemn you because of your sins. But likewise, he didn't come to condone your sin. See, now, sometimes people will use this sovereignty of God teaching to say, well, Maybe God just wants me to be drunk in Vegas every night. You know, they're, they're saying, well, this is what's happening. It must be God's will. And see, that's something else too. You can't just pray God's will. You pray His will, but you don't just pray, que say ra, say ra, God, whatever will be, will be. Let your will be done. I mean, I was at the hospital across the street. There was a gentleman in there, and he was hooked up to tubes and everything, and, and he was, according to the family, you know, uh, he was near his time to step over. Uh, he was conscious. Uh, I knew him real well. I knew the family. But, you know, here's something, and I, I say this to my ministry team specifically. You can't take people beyond their faith. You can't, you can't take people beyond their faith. You can have faith beyond their faith, but you can't take them beyond their faith. And before I went into that room, uh, the wife pulled me off to the side, and she said, when we go in there, she said, I want you to know something, Pastor. I know you believe in healing, and, I, and our church believes in healing, but my family, they're all from out of town. They're Christians, but they don't believe in that healing stuff. They, they just don't. So when you go in there and you pray for him, her husband, when you go in there, I want don't be praying none of that healing stuff because that's that's embarrassing. So I go in and, and I pray for peace. You can't take them beyond where they are. Now, if the Spirit of God would have come upon me and said, lay hands on him, this is going to be a special healing right here. If that would have happened, I go with the flow. You know, you always are led by the Holy Spirit. But if you don't sense anything, so I, I prayed that there would be peace in the family and comfort and, and that type of thing. And uh, so then the wife went over and she laid hands on him. And she said, Lord, whatever your will is, you know, if you, if you want to make him feel better, make him feel better. But if you want to take him home, about that time I could see his eyes. You know, like, Whoa, wait a minute here. You know, don't be, you can pray that over you, but don't you be praying that over me. You know, because when it really comes right down to it, you can't just say, well, thy will be done. See, they get that out of the Lord's Prayer, what's called Lord's Prayer, which is actually an, an Old Testament prayer, but they take it out of context because they're saying, we want your will done here on earth the same way your will is done in heaven. Thy will be done. But um, when we pray, we are to pray His will. Now, you may say, well, what, what do you mean? Well, what, what is His promise? I am the Lord thy God who heals you. You know, so we have that promise. So we can pray for 
healing. That's okay. He's the Lord our God who heals us. 1 Peter 2.24, by the stripes of Jesus we have been healed. We can pray that. We can say, Father, in the name of Jesus, your word says by the stripes of your son, Jesus, we have been healed. And so I claim that healing right now in the name of Jesus. Jesus has already paid the price. But see, what we nullify with the sovereignty of God teaching is the reality of what you believe is what you're going to receive. You receive what you believe. That's why what you listen to is so important. Where you place your faith is important. See, if you listen to what God says, and then you say what God says over your life, you're going to get what God says. But if you listen to what the enemy says, and then you say what the enemy says, then you're going to get what the enemy says. Because that's where you place your faith. This is why it's so important to go to a Bible-believing church or to sit under teachers, you know, even the people you listen to online, who are Bible-believing people and not just people trying to get clicks or likes or whatever. Because what you hear regularly is what you're going to end up believing. And, well, this is what's happened on our college campuses today. You can have Bible-believing kids and you send them off to a, uh, a woke university. And next thing you know, they come home and, and all they can talk about is uh, climate change and, and how, you know, you're weird. Which, by the way, climate change. <laughs> the scripture says, as time progresses, there will be morning and evening, summer and winter, hot and cold. That's, gonna, that's the way it's going to be. And there will be a time when we have a new heaven and a new atmosphere, but that's going to happen after the millennial reign of Jesus, and, that's, and that happens after the seven-year tribulation. So if Jesus were to return today, right after our fellowship dinner, because the food in there is really good, but if Jesus were, if, if he were to return today, it'd be a thousand and seven years, and we will have a refurbished atmosphere and earth. But between now and then, don't worry about it. Of course, come on, have common sense. You don't want to just go out and, and throw oil on the ground or whatever. You know, there's, there's common sense things. But, but don't let the enemy make you worry about it. All right. So, uh, John 8, 31 and 32. Now, listen to these qualifiers. And Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Do you see the word if there? See, that little word is ignored in a lot of the promises of God. It says, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And, and, and in the Greek language, it would be okay to add this. And, that's, that word and is uh, the Greek word chi, kappa, alpha, iota. And it just ties these thoughts together. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And people go around saying, hey, if you know the truth, the truth will make you free. Well, that's a nice quote out of a movie or something, whatever. But the reality is, if you abide in his word, if you abide in his word, then you're going to be his disciple. And then, if you do that, then you will know, gnosko, you'll know the truth, and the truth will will make you free, set you free. You know, I, early on, probably 20-some years ago, 25, 30 years ago, we had a man that came to one of our Bible studies here at the church, and, and he said, uh, the Bible doesn't say set you free, it says make you free. Well, a lot of that depends on which translation you're using. But, 
But you know, the reality is that sometimes we get caught up with such little details. If you're bound up and you are free, you don't care if you were made free or set free or got free or whatever. You're just, you're just happy that you're free. You know, <laughs> just get me free. All right. Now, here's something else. Are there conditions when we pray? Look at Mark 11, 23. And this is a scripture that we use all the time here. It says, For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. So first of all, the mountains, uh, many times in the Bible is referring to a kingdom. So we're, we're saying here that it's talking about the kingdom of darkness. There's a kingdom of God and there's a kingdom of darkness. So who I say to you, whoever says. So somebody's got to say something. Yeah. It's not just whoever thinks, whoever ponders. No, here's a qualifier. Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. And here's another qualifier. Does not doubt in his heart, but believes what? Believes that the things he says, those things he says will be done. Then, after all of that, you'll have whatever you say. But you've got to say it. You got to believe that what you say matters. You got to not have any doubt. Now, but let's go to the next verse. Therefore, now anytime that you come across the word therefore, it's going to tell you what the previous scripture was there for. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them. Now that's past tense. Technically, some of your Bibles will show it that way. Believe that you have received them. The word them is italicized in your Bible. That means it's not really there. Translators added it. So here's what it says. Jesus is saying, therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you have received and you will have. Another qualifier. When you ask for something in prayer that he has promised, you don't believe that it's on its way. You believe you got it. Already. And you say, well, I don't see it. Well, then that takes us over to another little scripture that says, you don't walk by sight. You walk by faith, not by sight. In other words, you, you, you live your life based upon what God says, not by what you see around you. Because if you look at what you see around you, you see death and destruction and weirdos. Now, I don't mean in here. <laughs> but I mean, if, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Come on. The world is full of strange people. <laughs> strange people. Yeah, I was up at the hospital the other day getting a checkup and I went in that bathroom up there at the hospital. They still have those signs. You know, please do not place your hands in the toilet. <laughs> what kind of an idiot? All right. 1 John 5, 14. Some of you remember the pizza, don't you? Yeah. 1 John 5, 14. Now this is the confidence we have in Him. If we ask anything, He hears us. If we ask anything, here's a qualifier. This really messes up the sovereignty of God. If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. But sometimes the qualifiers don't end with that verse. You have to read things in context. Look at the very next verse. And, there's that Greek word again. Say it with me. Kappa, Alpha, Iota. It's the word chi. It means and connects these thoughts. And if we know, if we know he hears us. 
So if we ask something according to his will, he hears us. And if, if, you see that? And if we know he hears us. You can't be going around saying, I wonder if God heard that prayer. Is God, is God, God, are you hearing me? No. If you know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we've asked of him. See, there's these little qualifiers all through the word of God that totally destroy the sovereignty of God teaching. Now, yes, God is all powerful. Yes, God is omniscient, omnipresent. Yes, God can do anything unless he has delegated something to someone else. And he has delegated to all of his angels and all of humanity free will. And because of that free will, God's not going to step in and make a decision for you. Look, if he predestined everyone to worship him, then we would be nothing more than just artificial intelligence robots. We'd just be a room full of AIs. Instead of AOs. AO. AO. No, we're not. Cut that out when we... All right. Jeremiah 29.11 For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Wow. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. Does that mean everybody finds God? No. Only people who look. Oh boy. Matthew 7, 7, Jesus said this, Ask and it will be given unto you. What if you don't ask? Okay, Charles Capps told me this one day. He said, he said you can take something in the Bible and reverse it and sometimes it will give you a, a clearer meaning. Oh. Uh, so ask and it will be given to you. Don't ask and it won't be given to you. Makes sense, doesn't it? Seek and you will find. Don't seek and you won't find. Knock and it will be open to you. If you don't knock, the door's not going to be opened. Wow. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be opened wow does that sound like God's in total control there no he's delegated that control to you you're the one that's going to have to knock ask or seek he's not going to do it for you see and a lot of people think that God will do things for you and he will through his angels because they are here to minister for us however that's only if we meet the conditions unless he supernaturally intervenes for some specific purpose and one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, uh, the working of miracles, or something happens unique. Are you following me? Okay. We're getting closer and closer to the roast beef. In Revelation 21.6, Jesus said, well, the scripture says, and he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. Did it just say, and they will inherit all things? No, it says, and he who overcomes will inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Listen to this, Psalm 103, 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. Don't use the fact that I am teaching that the sovereignty of God teaching is incorrect to, to get yourself to the place 
to where you just don't know what to do. I'm going to tell you right now. Here's what you do. You take the Word of God and you eat it. And you do what it says to do and you don't do what it says not to do and everything's going to be fine. Okay? And don't, don't con yourself. You know, the Bible talks a lot about self-deception. Do not allow self-deception to come in. Don't think that you're the exception to God's rule. You know, he, he says don't do this, but my circumstances are different. No, no, that's, that doesn't work with God. And here's the thing. When it comes to healing, understand this. There's a lot of different ways that the Bible talks about healing. There may be conditions in one that you don't meet, but there may be conditions in another that you do. You may have tried one thing, and I say this respectfully, but you may have tried one thing and it didn't seem to work, and so you don't know what to do. Well, there's always this. If you're a, a born-again believer and you're a part of a church, here's what James, the brother of Jesus, said. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Well, that's, that's a condition right there. It doesn't just say go to church. He says, call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 15, and the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up and if he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. So there's, there's a lot of different paths to get to God's will, what he desires for you, okay? But each path has conditions. And too often, we just back off the conditions. We just say, well, it, that must have been God. You know, I, I know a guy one time that had his house damaged in a tornado, and he goes, huh, well, God must have a plan in this for me. No, God, God is not the destroyer. He's not the one making you sick. He's not the one that's causing your, your life to be in peril. He is the deliverer. He is the saver. He's the one, he's the saver and the savior. He's the one who sets you free. He's not the one who binds you. He's the one who blesses you. He's not the one who curses you. All right. Uh, now, here, here's, here's another path for healing. James 5.16. Now, confess your trespasses. Boy, we need to get that straightened out. I don't have enough time for it right now, but I'll give you a quick preview that doesn't mean sit down with somebody at church and tell them everything in the world you've ever done wrong. Or it doesn't mean sit in a little box and roll the window and say, hey, it's been 12 days since I've told everybody what I did wrong, you know, whatever. No, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about forgiveness and repentance. And if you have done something to someone, let's say, for example, and let's, we'll, we'll pick James's mama here. I love her, she loves me. So this is just an illustration. But let's say one day I said something really snarky to her and, and it offended her. And then she said something snarky back to me. and I got all ticked off. And Next thing you know, we're coming to church, but she's sitting over there and I'm sitting over there and we're not talking to each other. Well, what this is talking about is I need to go to her and say, I apologize. I know I did wrong. I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm not going to talk bad about you anymore. I repent of it. And I'm just confessing that to you right now. And uh, you're my sister. And I love you. Okay? So, I confess my trespasses to her for what I had been talking about her and everything. And then it says, and pray for one another. So then I just say, hey, let, let's, just, let's just pray together, okay? And then the next line says, that you may be healed. Wow! So in other words, getting things right with your brothers and sisters, confessing to them and, and repenting and, and, and asking for forgiveness and forgiving, all is connected. That's another path to healing. Hmm. Somebody said, well, I don't want to do that one. Okay, well, whatever. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. All right. John 5, 12. And just so you will all know, this is my last piece of paper. I know that you were hoping that there was another stack. Oh, wait, time out. <laughs> 
Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not, did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn, a multitude being in that place. So here's somebody that was healed. He didn't even know who it was that healed him. See, so your healing can come through just a miraculous act of somebody walking up to you in Walmart and just saying, hey, the Lord just spoke to me. In the name of Jesus, you're healed. You say, well, that'll never happen. You're right, it won't to you because you don't believe it. But if you believe in the miracle power of God and that something as weird as that could happen, Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, that, see, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. What does that mean? That means that man's actions would affect his future health and healing. You catch that? So what we do does matter and we have the choice. In other words, Jesus was saying to him, listen, son, you've got a choice. I, I spoke over you and healed you and you took up your bed and you walked. And that's fine. But just let me tell you something. And you have a choice to make here. You go and you get that sin out of your life. Because if you don't, the condition you were in will be better than the condition you're going to be in. And you don't hear that preached a whole lot in charismatic churches. But we're full gospel people, right? We believe all the word. So we need to know that. Hmm. See, we need to know the balance between grace and obedience. 2 Corinthians 5.10, Paul said this, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And that letter is written to the church. So in other words, your salvation will not be in question at the, at the judgment seat of Christ. Your, your salvation will not be. The fact that you're there means you're in heaven and you made it. But there is still going to be an accountability for what you have done, and it says, in the body. In other words, right now. So what's going on in the world right now? Raging insanity. Uh, there's the culture right now. The cancel culture. Trying to cancel our history. Well, that is a move of the enemy also attempting to cancel our Christian heritage. Hmm. But remember this. Bottom line. Jesus paid the price in full for your healing, for your salvation, for everything. His grace is sufficient for you. Don't be concerned and worry about your sin. Just don't do it. Okay? He paid the price for your salvation. He paid the price for your healing. And remember this, 1 Peter 2.24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. In other words, he paid the price for your sin. So all we have to do is confess our sin, repent, and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. This is talking to believers. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed. He paid the price for your healing. All right. Is God sovereign? The answer is technically, yes, he is. However, to teach it to the extreme and say that everything that happens happens because he caused it to happen, then that means you would be saying that one third of the angels rebelled with Lucifer because God made them do it that the Holocaust happened because God instructed Hitler and his Nazis to kill all the Jews. No, no. 
Romans, now let's, let's take a look at uh, James 1.17. Every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, in whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. So bottom line is this. God is a good God, and His will is for you to have full abundance in every area. That's His will. That none should perish. That's His will. The enemy, he gave the enemy. He gave Lucifer free will. Lucifer chose poorly, and he has been judged. His sentence hasn't been carried out yet, but until it is, he's confined to the earth. And God, through his son, gave us authority over all the power of the enemy so that there's nothing that we should fear and nothing, no harm will come upon us. Is that good news? All right. So today was just a little bit of theology straightening out. Not that you guys needed it. I'm going to be giving a lesson on satire one of these days. Let's all stand. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you the glory. We give you the praise. We thank you, Father, that you have given us the ability to choose. And Father, with that choice, we, we say this boldly. We choose you. We choose your Son. We choose the Holy Spirit. We choose your Word. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, amen.